For those who have not been part of the internal workshop, I'd like to reiterate uh, something that Melanie's also brought up um, uh, before, which is um, how we came to the central meta theme of occupation precisely in July 2014. This was, of course, the time of the unrelenting Israeli onslaught on Gaza, a time when, like many people on the planet, we found it impossible to avoid the central colonial occupation of our time. Like many people, not just in the movements named Occupy, we also found it necessary to return to what it means to be here, to come together, to think together, to act together now and with these compromised places, bodies, and environments in seemingly relentless bleak times. Thinking with the negative now more than ever and in different ways. I'm privileged to be on a panel with three women whose praxis I deeply admire. I'm just going to gaze at them for a few seconds. Um, each of them has a different way to put themselves on the line. Each, for me, presents the possibility of occupying this strange place called academia in ways that brings together personal courage, radical commitment, and razor-sharp analysis of the often confusing and always contradictory ways in which capital occupies space and attempts to dispose of bodies, places, natures, forms of knowledge, and dreams of survival, if not revolution. Their work always reminds us of that which slips the grasp of attempted disposability, the dream of political life that Prashani Naidu so eloquently spoke of last night. And for those of you who weren't there, it's going to record it. Recorded thanks to Zen Mari. My first long-term research project was on, oh sorry, I'd like to revisit three moments of my own work through these keywords, capital, disposability, and occupation. My first long-term research <coughs> project was on the agrarian origins of industrialization in South India. I studied an industrial town called Tirupur, which by, had by the 1990s become India's main exporter of knitted garments. And what attracted researchers to this town was that it was composed of a dense web of small firms and a baroque choreography of people, cotton, thread, cloth, machines, and finance across the urban form. The question asked by researchers was whether this was just another occasion of a global process of informalization and casualization, part of the global race to the bottom and labor, labor standards and work trajectories that Nick Theodore has worked on for a long time or whether it was a new form of post-Fordist industry called the Industrial District, which allowed the accumulation of capital through a new form of socio-spatial dispersal that did away with the old contradictions between labor and capital. Through long-term historical and ethnographic research, I found something different. I found that the architects of this urban industrial form were men of peasant worker and modest caste origins. They had come into an industrial form that was characterized by large firms controlled by traditional business castes, an all-male workforce, and vibrant Communist Party labor unions engaged in a long history of struggle. Over a generation, several of these men's di men dismantled this industrial form and replaced it with something much more fractured and fractal. These self-made men, quotation marks, basically pulled the rug out from the owners of, uh, uh, owners pulled the rug out from, uh, of the feet, pulled the rug out from the, under the feet of the owners of capital, by pooling small resources and starting, starting tiny units connected through networks. And over a decade or so, the older industrial form came crashing down while a new form emerged in its ruins, a feminized form which led in women workers for the first time, but also a much more dynamic and despotic form that took the report to global markets. Conceptually, I argued following Julian Hart's insights that the divide between informal economy and industrial district was unuseful but also that an older agrarian tradition of Marxist critique of capitalism was more helpful uh, for explaining these strange industrial dynamics in a town remade seemingly by self-made men. The agrarian question, as this tradition is called, was formulated in the late 19th century and revived by radical third worldists and feminist and Marxist scholars of the 1970s, committed to peasant revolution and to radical agrarian change iconically in Vietnam and across Southeast Asia, but more generally across Asia, Latin America, and Africa. Incidentally, this is all precisely the moment that radical urban studies emerges in reflection to 1968 and all that, and my argument is that the partitioning of rural and urban in so-called radical geography emerges at exactly this point, and is of course securely part of left orthodoxy today. 
The agrarian question is a framework that approaches capitalism as always differentiated and founded on difference, both the differences of nature that people in agriculture have long had to adapt to, and the differences of social power and organization, that is sex, gender, kinship, ethno-racial, ethno and religious difference. What was interesting in the situation I sought to explain was that former peasants had embodied a process through which agrarian difference had become constitutive of urban and industrial capitalism. I had a kind of cheeky response to the fairly romanticized scholarly tradition of subaltern studies. I asked, can the subaltern accumulate capital? <laughs> because it appeared that these men of modest, appeared that these men of modest class and class origins had indeed been innovative makers of history and geography. But by making a stronger and more ruthless articulation of gender, uh, gender caste and class power, if this was a subaltern occupation of space, it wasn't. The Paris Commune is something that maybe more and um, Haitian Revolution, maybe the places to look. If this was a subordinate occupation of space, it was one set firmly on the terrain of capitalist, patriarchal, and caste power. I ended that work by suggesting that we might return to Marx's conception of the accumulation of capital as paralleling another kind of accumulation of surplus bodies and depleted soils. I'll come back to this. What I, what I didn't fully do, though my friend, the late MSS Pandian, who was at JNU with Dereen and Manaf so at the, the university, former university of Manaf. My friend, the late MSS Pandian, indispensable scholar and theorist on and from South India, who tried to push me on, which was what it meant, what it means to think about caste dominate, domination in this formulation. If I return to it now, I'd return with a notion of occupying the body. Uh, and the notion that several people have argued that property in the body takes many forms other than chattel slavery and the form that Marx sarcastically called free labor, which he also called wage slavery. Occupying the body is an attempt not just at privatization, but at fixing properties, whether these are tagged as race, gender, caste, or of foreign and local bodies, as we see in South Africa today. Occupying the body attaches a set of affective and material values to varieties of human animals to sort people into an always provisional perhaps never, never explicit, but nonetheless, nonetheless deeply powerful racial apparatus within the workings of capital. And thanks to yesterday's discussion group for helping me come to this. I said I'd return to Marx's second conception of accumulation, not of capital, but of wasted lives and wasted environment, environments. Vinay Gidwani was supposed to be here, and he has, of course, long thought about the dialectics of waste and value. Um, we have used the term disposability here, which in geography is impossible to think of, without Melissa Wright's work on disposable women and Ciudad Juarez. When I came to this kind of uh, conception in 2002, I tried to think with a strange concept, <coughs> detritus, to think about the materiality of commodities, human and non-human commodities, after circuits of exchange and use value have done their bit and left them in, in, to rot. I came to South Africa first in 2002, um, and was quickly drawn into researching a very different kind of landscape of capital that underwear production in Tirupur. Frankly, I didn't want to become an underwear scholar um, the rest of my life. Uh, that was a joke. <laughs> Thank you. In Durban, uh, I was drawn into the lived struggles of people living adjacent to oil refineries and other polluting industries, the fence line communities that have been the long standing work of Victor Munich, which I admire. Uh, so the commodity that tried us here included unemployed and under underemployed people, but also the very times of suffering with respiratory ill health, as well as long-term and undocumented leukemia and other forms of cancer. People had refused these forms of social domination and had been experimenting uh, with bringing environmental and labor struggles together. But for various reasons, these attempts stumbled and hit against a set of obstacles to progressive change. And my, my study shifted from a story of community, community resistance to neoliberal, uh, from a story of neo, <coughs> from a story of community resistance to neoliberal postcoloniality to something else, an analysis of limits to change. So the book is called Apartheid Remains, meaning that people contend with remains of various pasts in various ways. The study of limits took me to three key areas of thinking in order to analyze and represent the specificity of capital's presence as an occupying power. Again, I would have had an image which I didn't get together, but it's an image, a uh, very beautiful photograph of, a uh, black and white uh, photograph of uh, oil refinery with uh, 
guys playing football in front of it, and it just juxtaposes and iconic contrasts corporate apartheid era, corporate power, and, uh, and uh, community survival. Um, so the study of limits took me to three areas of, of thinking in order to analyze and represent the specificity of capital's presence as an occupying power, but also of popular opposition, opposition to being rendered disposable life. First is the notion of the geographical present as always palimpsestic, or composed by the remains of multiple space times. Walter Benjamin is crucial here, particularly his notion of, people, of people's capacity to conserve the means of revolution, a point that was central to the work of the late Fernando Coronel. Second, pushed in considerable part by Ruth Gilmore, uh, I'm attempting to think about what the general significance of the black radical tradition is for the analysis of limits and failure. We can read these themes as central preoccupations in Franz Fanon and Taylor James, as well in uh, Michel Rocotrio's Indispensable Silencing the Past. Third, I follow a, a path that rethinks the history and geography of biopolitics through a Marxist lens that is with an attention to contradiction, failure, and struggle. Through the work of Keith Breckenridge, here at Weiser, but also with a specifically black Marxist attention to disposability and necropolitics, use Achille Remy's term. Since we know that in Ruth Gilmore's terms, the golden age of transatlantic capitalism was also what she calls the age of human sacrifice, the burden of palimpsestic critique informed by the general insights of the black radical tradition is to revisit the historical geography of racial segregation to show something other than the inevitability of black death. And this brings me back to occupying the body and the question of subaltern praxis as lived vitality. And here, Aristina and Koi, where's, where's Aristina? Anastina reminds me that we can still use Henri Lefebvre from a perspective rooted in questions of blackness. This disrupts the whiteness and idolatry in, com in contemporary Lefebvreana in geography <laughs> and urban studies. This might also provide a different approach to the, to the demand that black lives matter. In fact, what does this powerful hashtag mean through the intellectual and aesthetic traditions that Ruthie gestured to through the work of Clyde Woods, through what he calls a blues epistemology? This is exactly where my palimpsestic critique of the contradictions of capital and biopolitics has taken me. To the lived edges of segregation before, during, and after apartheid, to the vitality of bodily praxis that is important both to Lefebvre and to the blues, the spirituals of the city, as Richard Wright calls them, and which Clyde, Clyde Woods elaborates in, as in his words, the cries of a new society being born. But there's another term I must mention alongside biopolitics and the blues, and that is the transit transatlantic circulation of black power and black cons consciousness that are very much a part of what our students at WITS are working with and thinking through and imagining the university in the new society being born. And here Angela Davis is also crucial as a figure who connects the black <coughs> radical tradition and its critique of racial capital <coughs> to thinking with and through the blues and I'm thinking of her book on black women blues singers. The strains of the blues that I'm working with are in a visual register, remember my photograph? In the photographic work of black documentary photog uh, photography, attentive to the specific pathos of damaged life in the shadows of corporate power. So my argument is that photography has provided a critical vocabulary to attend to the occupation of racial capital, uh, and also of the vital, uh, also to the vitality of refusal to be rendered disposable life. I'm sorry, I'm showing you these pictures. There's something I've stumbled into uh, while writing Apartheid Remains, and that has to do with people labeled Indian and colored, some of whom signed up for the collective project of black politics, and others who did not. Habiba Badrun, another indispensable scholar, has made a very powerful and poetic case for thinking about South African Muslim and colored life, these categories blur in South Africa, as building on the silencing of painful racial and sexual histories of Indian Ocean forced migrants, unable to attend to their pasts, and consigned to forms of internal violence, internalized violence, particularly violence against women's bodies, of violence through substance abuse, and other violent forms of what I call occupying the body. Attending to what Michelle Rolf Trio calls silencing the past should be as much a part of our uh, radical ambitions as forging solidarity with the few who can publicly and overtly resist their social domination. What Badrun and others suggest is that underneath all this is an encounter of epistemes, of the traditions of what Gilroy called the Black Atlantic and circuits of the Indian Ocean, which include 
as Francoise Vergès has argued, and perhaps argued today, circuits of imperial and military power, forced labor, Islam, imperialization, all of which confront the legacies of black politics in ways that pull it away from its Americanism in various ways. We should expect the futures of black power and of blackness itself to change and morph in new ways. Achille Mbembe has put the question in different ways in his important essay on African modes of self-writing, in which he asks how, how we might represent African futures outside the safe confines of Marxist nationalism and nativism. And I read this as a call to um, a Marxist internationalism, non-nativist, non Marxist internationalism. I'm not sure if that makes sense, <laughs> but I read it. That's what I read it as. Africa's Indian Ocean stages exactly this encounter. What forms of self writing and world writing or geography might yet emerge from these encounters? And more importantly, what kinds of radical geography might emerge to forge as yet unthought solidarities between bodies, traditions, environments, and poetics of refusal? Thank you.